Hi, this is uh, Ross Payton here for Roleplaying Public Radio, and we're here with episode 16, Help Me to Help You. And of ah, course, the sweet 16 of RPPR. Yes, and of course with me here is uh, Tom Church, the co-host and, um, I don't know what Think else. long and hard before you finish that line. <laughs> All around great guy. Yeah. Well done, yeah. well done. This I'll episode... stay my hand now. Okay, thanks Tom. This Always. episode is... A bit different from all the other ones we've done so far. Instead of focusing on how to run a game, how to create <clears> adventures, uh, we're looking on the other side of the uh, GM screen. This is about players, how to be a better player. You see, it's it's from another level. Yeah. We come at many different levels. Yeah, all kinds of levels. We're we well, got so many damn levels. We're shifting paradigms and levels and got warp keys. Oh, fuck yeah. Yeah, warp whistles. Yeah. That That's gay. What do you mean? That's from Super Mario Brothers 3. Three. Yeah. I know. That's not gay. That's awesome. That's old school. If you say so. You didn't like Mario? Yeah, of course I did, back when it came out. Yeah, well, it's it's coming back around again, Tom. It's retro. Oh, it's retro. Yeah. Retro. Yeah. Isn't that just a cute term for old? Old that is cool. Oh, old that is cool. Did you make that up? No. Why The not? internet did. Why didn't you? Because the internet did. Oh, the internet did. Yeah. The internet just does everything. You play nothing but old video games anyways. What The last shout-outs for the last three or four episodes, hey, look, here's an obscure computer game that I played, and it's cool, and I'm not going to give Ross a link to it, so he'll have to find something on Google that's not really... Well, that's because I hate you. Oh. Well, thanks, I guess. Always, man. Anyways, we got a lot of stuff to cover. It's been a while since we've been here, because I've been doing interviews. And, and I've uh, been working my lame-ass job. Yep, and I started a second podcast up. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, first, we have some sad news that you may have, you probably already heard if you're uh, involved in the world of gaming. Eric uh, Wujek, is that right? Wujek, I think. Wujek uh, has passed away. You might know him as the creator of Amber the Diceless RPG, or more importantly, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and Other Strangeness, the role playing game. First game I ever played. This is. Yeah, same here. This is the first game I've ever played. I remember uh, the first game in the first adventure I ever ran was the scenario in the book, and my character died. He was a mutant raccoon ninja biker, and he died because he opened a door that was loaded with C4 explosives. Tragic. Yeah. And my GM was like, you you should have used your sixth sense ability. I was like, uh, okay. Yeah, I was playing a mutant alligator government agent. You didn't die in your first adventure. No, I did not. So because the GM was I'm more the hard- GM was a pussy and would never kill his players. No, my GM was not like that at all. Anyways, uh, <laughs> how are you doing out there, Ashley? Um, so we, of course, mourn his loss. It seems a lot of game designers have passed away lately. Not only him, Gary Gygax, obviously, and then I forgot the man's name, but the creator of the Judges Guild, which is before my time. I never read any of this up, but it was sort of. One of the first old school D and D adventure companies. They created uh, the Wilderlands and a lot of other classic adventures. So um, I don't know what it is. There's just some supernatural serial killer killing uh, game designers or something. Motherfucker. And I want to be one. So uh, what does that say about me? It means you need to hire a bodyguard. Okay. Well. Tom, you're certainly big enough to guard my body. You're, you'd certainly make a good shield. Are you saying I'm fat, Ross? You said it, not me. Uh, no, I'm pretty sure you said it first. No, no, no. I'm, I'm just letting that... I used to be enormous. Yeah, that's true. You have lot, lost a lot of weight. About 110 pounds. Damn. That's yeah. like a whole other person. That's like with two anorexics. Ooh, I'm edgy, a... Ross. <laughs> Real edgy. Yeah, that's... Um... The intellectual humor you get So here. we go from mourning the loss of some of the greats to talking about anorexics. Yep, that's that's how we roll. Anyways, um, like we mentioned earlier, we're working on a lot of other things, or at least, you know, I am. Um, what? <laughs> God. <laughs> Every day. I know, I know, because you, you have a real job, and I work part-time, and blah, 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 blah. Anyways, um, what I've started is a second podcast. This is called Rail, uh, Railery. It's a comedy video podcast updated about once a week 
with a new short video. We've done three videos so far. We're going to have a fourth one up shortly. And uh, it's just along the lines of uh, Chad. Well, it's not a single ongoing story. Each one is has it's, its what, it's whatever bullshit we happen to think up. Yeah, and then shoot. Yeah, basically. Uh, although Tom, well, Tom did help out. Uh, did you help on Oregon Trail Thirteen? The first one we did was a cartoon version of Oregon Trail Thirteen, which is one of the first RPPR uh, shows, which is a little parody about the Oregon Trail as a modern video game. No, actually, I think that was just you and Chris on that one. All right, but you did well. Next I, I, cartoon, I wrote and uh, did and helped with uh, the next one we're doing. Yeah, well, the next cartoon, which is the Extreme XP, which is being worked on right now by a very talented cartoonist, uh, Casey Green. You can check him out at Rumblow dot com or Horribleville dot com. But uh, he is bringing Tom's words to life. Indeed, in animated form, sort of. It's really kind of like a slideshow, really fast. But you know. he's it's good. Yeah, it's all like good. the Professor Brothers, you know. Yeah, you know that music video, George Washington. Yeah, I do. Yeah, it's the same sort of style, only different type. And awesome. Yeah, exactly. It's the internet. It's it works. Really awesome. So, if you're a fan of comedy and things that are funny, check it out. Tell your friends. Um, tell your enemies. Tell everyone, and post it on Dig. Just tell people. And dig it. Just dig break it. Put down it on and Dig. Tell people. Yeah, and link it on your blog, especially if you have a, like a really big website. Because you do, in fact, have a blog. Yeah. Exactly. Fuck a guy, Jim. Yes. Anyways, um, so enough of that shameless promotion. Uh, although one of our, uh, the second one we did, Angst of Katanas, is about gaming. It actually ties into this episode um, because it's about character creation, about a player being a real dick to the GM, and the GM being also a dick to the player. So, Well, it's, it's, it's back and forth. It's a, cir- it's a circle of jerkiness. Circle jerk. Well, you said it. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Way to go it was there. the right thing to say. Yeah, I know. I sort of realized that when I was thinking the words, and I was like, <clears throat> I'm not going to say what I'm thinking of. But it's and... okay. But then you thought, it's okay. I have this dumbass over here. I'll save it for me. <laughs> okay, Jeff. <laughs> All right. It's uh, nice that you think of it that way, Tom. I do. Um, anyways, so, uh, of course, the other big news is obviously 4th edition Dungeons & Dragons has been released. And uh, I was dumb enough to order it on Amazon, so my box set hasn't gotten here yet. Although I have read copies from my friends, and I've played one session of it. Not ran it, uh, yeah. played it. I haven't played it myself. I've flipped through it. The general result I've got is kind of a resounding eh. Actually, it's pretty fun. It's it's really a lot of improvements over 3.x, but they've kind of made it i mean i've heard some people have described it as a board game with some role playing in it and you really need the mini you absolutely have to have the miniatures you absolutely have to have the the grid i mean you don't have miniatures i mean you could use dice or pennies or whatever else but uh without that sort of representation you can't really do it and uh it's really all about combat traps and puzzles there's not much non-combat stuff in there in fact they they sort of the GM, the DM guy, sort of emphasizes just get players from one encounter to the next as quickly as possible, and sort of. Which honestly is the one thing about D and D most the pl- other players I know don't like about D and D. That it is basically just one combat encounter after another. Yeah, but the, the combat itself is actually run a lot better, and the first level characters are a lot more viable. I mean, wizard, you no longer have the wizard problem of um, one spell a day. Uh, you know, thanks for that. Dumb. Anyways, dude, uh, I'm sick. Oh. What's your excuse? Uh, nothing, nothing. Um, so, anyways, the wizard has the you know every class has these at will powers per day and ca- powers and per encounter powers, and it works out pretty well because you can always do something kind of cool. Um, I wish they kind of made a little more cinematic, take you know blatantly ripped off stuff from Iron Heroes for stunting and things like that. But that's easily well, the cinematic it off. stuff. That's really kind of up to the players and the GM. Yeah, well, I mean, Iron Heroes really encouraged that because you got bonus dice and bonuses for attacking when you did something really cool, and it emphasized the terrain of the battlefield more. But anyways, I just like Iron Heroes. Have I mentioned that? Uh, yeah, that's, yeah, that's been made. <laughs> so it's fun. Um, it's basically a very streamlined version of hack and slash dungeon crawling, and if that's what you want, it can do it probably better than a new version of three point three, three point whatever D and D. And um, so yeah, it's uh, I'll be talking more about the game that I was in, I played in, uh, in the anecdotes uh, later on. So yeah, 
we'll be talking. We'll have a whole episode on Fourth Ed D and D sooner or later, probably in the next episode or something like that. I don't know if you behave. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, we also inter- I interviewed the Alpha Omega team. They're the uh, guys who designed this post apocalyptic RPG that's kind of like Rifts or Shadowrun with magic and science and all kinds of stuff. And it's about alien astronauts because like. The angels and demons, they're both alien races that fight on Earth every 10,000 years. And now they come back and there's all these post-apocalyptic stuff. So, Wow. Yeah. It's a, it's a fun game. It looks like a fun game. I don't know if I'll be running it anytime soon, but the artwork's pretty. Well, that's... Well, and they have you... lots of guns. Oh, and the yeah. guns have spikes on them. Well, there you go. Yeah. So, what else do you need? Tits. They have those. <laughs> I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> so if you wanted to play Rifts, but you hated Palladium System, I would recommend Alpha <clears throat> Omega, because the system is actually not crappy. Like, Well, I'm on like... it like shit on Velcro. Let's do it. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll probably be running that at some point. Anyways. Um, of course, then we did the GURPS Yakuza. Uh, that's one of the things we did uh, in our between episodes. Uh, you can re- listen to the actual play, although and look, I, I should put a warning on it. It's very, very violent. Well... Yeah. And look, I understand that I said the word like a lot. Yeah. However, I feel with our next real play episode, I will be vindicated. <laughs> I think I will. Yeah, because you brought in a player who says like even more than you do. Like by a like, factor like of five. Ten, maybe. Yeah. Uh, Aaron, he, well, he just, yeah Aaron, the defender of Sluggy Freelance, apparently yeah. gets stage fright. Or something. Yeah, he just has a really hard time getting words out of his mouth. That aren't like. No, he has easily, if you counted like as a word, then very easy. Yes. Yeah. But So I guess this is a kind of a good segue to actually talk about the meat and potatoes of this episode, right? Um, well, we got a f- few more things. I just want to mention, I really thought it's a, uh, the Yakuza game. The comments, uh, if you look on the uh, entry, they're pretty interesting. Yeah, fun game. Not enough players, but everyone was commenting on how violent you guys were, except for treating the kid and the prostitute at the end so nicely. And people are like, oh, God, typical players, killing everybody except the little kid and the girl. Well, my job is to kill yeah. rival gang members. Right, which you did with your cannibalism and your sadism. I did. but I killed the fuck out of them. Why did just so the record's straight, Tom? Could you defend your actions and being nice to the kid and the prostitute at the end? Yes. Okay. Hannibal Lecter is was my inspir- was an inspiration for a lot of this. Okay. And he can go from urbane, nice, and civil to the murderous cannibal ra- rage. Right. He didn't kill everyone he happened across. True, but you had reasons to because the kid was uh, causing all the trouble with the gun and everything. So. Yes. But my orders were simply to uh, obtain the gun, not to eliminate the kid. Okay. Well, wouldn't it have been easier just to kill the kid? It would have been easier, but I don't do things quick and easy. Okay. Well, quick di- and easy is how you bake a cake. It's not how you are a member of a Yakuza family. <laughs> oh, very good. Um, but didn't you have another reason for uh, uh, not wanting to kill the kid? Well, yes, of course. If I, I was also going to, I was going to turn, it, turn him into the boss in case... The boss wanted to do anything about it. If not, then yes, I was going to... I was actually going to use that boy to uh, stuck my freezer up a little bit. You were going to eat him? <clears throat> well, yes. Oh, I thought you were going to recruit him. Well, there's that. Okay, because that's what you said. Yeah, but if the boss said, no, we have no use for this kid, and, oh, and he's a liability, get rid of him, uh, I would have followed those orders and gotten rid of him oh, completely. Oh, wow. So you, you're even... It was even worse than I thought. I thought you were being pragmatic and just wanting to recruit the kid. That's why. But no, you're, you're, you're willing to go. Okay. So, thanks, Tom. You're hey, a little creepier now. I normally don't play psychopaths. No, you just play ugly monster things. Is it my fault that that's my favorite kind of character to play? Um, yes. I don't really think you mean that. Okay, no? Is that the right answer? Do yeah. I get extra credit? Yeah, you get to keep that soda I bought you. Oh, snap. I Anyways, uh, speaking of monsters, didn't you want to check out... There's a new game, Privateer Press, is coming out that you're looking for. Oh, yeah, to. Monster Apocalypse. I, uh, Monster Apocalypse. Monster Apocalypse. Yeah. Uh, something like that. It's a collectible mini game, kind of like Hero Clicks or any num- pre-painted... Only with, like, with like, you know, like fully destroyable environments. Yeah, giant and, monsters. And I, I am a huge fan of giant monsters and yeah. stuff. They're going to be at Gen Con. That's good. 
So uh, that's probably where I'm probably where I'm going to be able to buy it. Yeah. yeah. Well, I don't know if they'll have it available for sale, but they'll have demos of the game. I certainly. And you know what else will be there? Game designers, f- m- people who make that game. You know what you could do with those people? Oh wait, yeah. This is one of those like Tom needs to interview someone. Yeah, like the forums. We have forums now. Uh, feel free to post there. You know, we're starting to pick up. Get a lot of chatter about games uh there are some some of our fans have wanted to see tom interview someone since i've been uh, doing it lately or at all is this because i haven't interviewed someone since my media class and 12 years ago uh no i just think it would be funny to see you interview anyone. and the fact that i usually just all what i usually contribute is gaming stories and i say fuck a lot yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be. So you're trying to see how that would translate see how that into horribly an backfires on you and turns into an awkward embarrassment that's humiliating for you and the interviewee and uh, hilarious for everyone else. It's like so. It's like so. Green grown and people. Uh, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah. What the fuck, man? What the fucking fuck? I'd like to see that. Would you? I'd like to listen to that, although because. Wouldn't be seeing it really. You'd be, you'd be re, you'd be stopping it, rewinding it, and I'd be it. making a techno remix out of it. Like what 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 the fuck? What, what the fuck? <laughs> fuck, fuck, fuck? What the fuck? Yeah, and exactly. I like, I'm DJ Fuckhead. GG Fuck Fuck Fuckhead. Exactly, exactly, exactly. I have uh, no talent. No talent. <laughs> hey, DJs have a lot of talent. I steal other people's r- r- records. Records. <laughs> It's sampling. It's about modern re- mashups. Don't you understand? Twenty first. They're record player players. Okay. <laughs> oh, They're thieves of music. Music, music that doesn't come from a movie by the way, soundtrack. Just to, by the way, every single one of those lines I just said, Henry Rollins did those. So you're even worse than all those DJs. Oh God, totally. Okay. But I, n- I never claim to be famous. No, your internet kind of famous. Ooh. Yeah. Holy crap! I'm selling out. No, because we'd need to get money for that. No, that's true. Which we kind of... Don't forget, we could donate. Yeah, actually, like, donate money so I can sell out. Yeah. Come on, guys. We're, we're capitalist whores. So uh, you can donate $2 a month. We'll give you a shout-out on the show. Put a link up to whatever site you want. And uh, give you a custom title on the forums, whatever you want. Just uh, donate and talk to us. We'll figure something out. So being shameless there. So uh, is that the yeah. bullshit? Uh yeah, but anyway, actually no. The last thing oh, is obviously more bullshit. Okay. The last ge- the game we played Thursday, we charged to record is oh, the yeah. GURPS Modern League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Um, basic what premise. Was that again, Ross? The GURPS Modern League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Okay, Sorry, because that was a little stilted. And yeah, 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 yeah. Thanks, Tom. I was going to edit that out, but since you brought it up, I have to leave it in. That's how, that's how I roll. Thanks, Tom. But yeah, that actually that we did our first session of that. I, it was it was a lot of fun. Okay, good. Um. The basic premise is it's set in the here and now, and any piece of fiction from any source that takes place in the here and now is true. So everything from James Bond, Ghostbusters, Rambo, Rambo, John McClane and Die Hard, uh, numerous video games, Max <clears throat> Payne, GTA, even though GTA takes place in alternate versions of the cities, they're basically the same thing, uh, to, yeah, uh, Stargate. Um, although I wouldn't have everything in Stargate because that's a ridiculously large franchise. True. So Doctor Who, because that all takes place off world and Doctor Who just shows up on Earth every once in a while. Uh, let's see what else. The X Files, uh, Supernatural. So, anyways, you get the basic idea. We had six players for the first session, that was, and uh, it was cl- a little clusterfuck. Care. Was pretty close yeah. to what it was. I didn't prepare as much as I should have, but it was a good. But also, fun. how much preparation for six players can you really do? Yeah, well, more than that. Well, whatever. Um, the main problem was obviously people showed up and made their characters. They didn't. I did not. And there were two hundred point GURPS characters, fourth ed. So it takes a little while to make a character. I was ready the moment I showed up. <laughs> Thanks, Doug. I like to reiterate that. Yeah. Hey, were you ready when it showed up? What? Were you ready when you showed up? I was ready. Were you? Are you sure? Yes. Okay. Anyways, so the basic scenario, uh, Ghostbusters in this world, I've taken the Ghostbusters, made it into a multinational corporation worth billions of dollars. Headquarters in Manhattan, the PCs had to be, were recruited by Fox Mulder of the X-Files, formerly of the X-Files. He's left the FBI uh, to go into the sewers of New York City of Manhattan get into an underground facility of the Ghostbusters and steal some data disks from a archive at the bottom of the complex. 
And, of course, they find out that the Ghostbusters are storing all kinds of horror movie monsters that are very like scary. Jason Voorhees. Freddy Krueger. The Lament Configuration. Hellraiser, in other words. Uh, let's see, what else? Phantasm. Chris- Chucky. Christine. Yeah, Christine. Um, so, anyways, the players, uh, sort of a s- disparate group. Uh, Tom, why don't you describe your character? I was playing a uh, former med- like scientist and med student who found uh, the lizard formula that Kurt Connors did from the Marvel Universe. Right. So um, he was playing, playing basically not a, the lizard, not the but like large lizard creature. Right. So lizard man. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see. So then Jason, who was also the other guy, because a player, he was playing Dean Winchester from season one Supernatural or pre season one Supernatural. If you've seen that, basically a guy who drives around in a '70s muscle car, listens to '70s rock, and hunts monsters. Exactly. Yeah. With a shotgun and you know tr- bag a bag of mojo tricks. Um. Let's see here. We had Firestarter, yeah, uh, yeah. mid twenties, you know, uh, version of Charlie. You know, the Firestarter. Uh, let's see here. Who else? We had Kabuki, which is from a semi obscure comic, basically a Japanese ninja assassin babe in a Kabuki outfit. Yeah. Uh, then we had Aaron, who was playing an employee of the Ghostbusters. He was their inside man, and he was just playing generic Ghostbuster, and with some psychic powers. Yeah, who else did we have? Uh, we had a... Um, yeah, we had a Highlander. Highlander, yeah, that was the the, the last player. The <coughs> Bob, who was a French aristocrat Highlander. Only a 200-point version, so he wasn't like... He was basically a guy who was unkillable. Yeah, that, that was his power. Yeah, which was kind of funny, but... <coughs> Anyways, so they... It was a fun game, but there was a lot of stuff that could have... Each player could have done that made a lot more enjoyable and then so now we're getting into the main topic of our show again how you know help me to help you how do you be a better player how do you make the game more fun i mean that's the whole point of gaming right i mean is to have fun yeah so or to prove what a great fiction writer you are yeah sure well we'll go with that but you know that's as opposed to you know writing and getting published to show ross yeah no one likes it <laughs> son of a bitch <laughs> okay. Anyways, the basic principle of being a better player is you've got to give to receive. You know, in order to help me to help you. Yeah. You you have to really put yourself out there and help the other people playing the game in order to have more fun yourself. And that and you know, First of all, like just you have to actually be active and do stuff. Yeah. That was the problem like when that was with, si- with the kabo- with uh Kabuki especially. Well, Bob too. I think Bob was yeah. even worse. Um because Bob the Highlander basically was sort of a passive player, and he was new to our group, so he's a little nervous and uncertain. I can understand that. But four out of the six players each got at least one chance to, to shine, but Bob and Kabuki didn't really have a chance. And that's because they didn't really put themselves out there, and partly because I didn't really give them a chance. Um, so... You know, the player who sits there quietly and is a wallflower is going to get outshined by the player who's like, let's try this, let's do this, I'm going to do this, and is willing to experiment and also to give other players opportunities. Um, so do you have any examples of that uh, during the game of players giving uh, other players opportunities? Um, oh. well, actually, I kind of think uh, me and Jason, like, gave us, we gave each other some like several opportunities with each other. All right. Like... Uh, <clears throat> The whole, like the whole, uh, like when you stick the phantasm balls on us. Yeah, that was pretty cool. That uh, I, I, I actually kind of forget. I have to listen to the actual play again. But yeah, I remember basically you climbed the elevator. You were at the bottom of this big pit with a computer and all the monsters that were getting released. You climbed up after the elevator and you, with your brute force, tore a hole in the b- floor to get in. But Jason was holding on to you, and with his skills, you know, as a very versatile hunter. He could disarm the, uh, uh, or, you know, re-rig the elevator, go back down to pick up everyone else. Uh, So it's teamwork. He's like, but yeah, he couldn't get up to the elevator, so. Yeah. So, again, you have to, and so it was, you know, technically Jason who saved everyone's butt by getting the elevator down, but he couldn't have done that without you. Plus, you were able to withstand the phantasm ball, and, you know, even though it hit you, you were a big, tough guy, and and you could smack it. I basically smashed it against the wall in my hand. Right. Um... So yeah, that's sort of the the, the thing we're talking. I think, about. Yeah, and of course you know Firestarter was was just setting everything on fire, right? And 
Um, obviously, Aaron gave everyone the opportunity to get in since he was the inside um, man in the Ghostbusters Corporation. Right. So that's sort of the first thing, and um, so being too passive is sort of one problem. You, if you aren't giving, if you aren't putting energy out into the group to be a little vague. Well, yeah, it's the GM's job to keep the game moving and keep, yeah. and make sure the players are having fun with, with to the best of his ability. Yeah, but I can't carry the GM can't carry everyone's weight. No, you can't. Yeah, um, yeah that that's a problem. I, I, the one thing I hate more than anything else when we're running a game is when I see one player who's not really putting himself out there. So then I can take whatever he gives me and spin it around and make it more fun. And make it more interesting, more challenging, more whatever. And uh, you know, if you're you're very re- if you're being very reticent, if you're being very withdrawn, I mean, what's the even point of being gaming? Because it's a social thing. Like, I mean, you gave me one of the, one of the other moments I shine too, which yeah. was with the the mimic bug. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, and everybody had their own. And since he was the guide in these New York sewers, because you've been dwelling in there, I figure I throw in a sewer monster, and the mimic was the first thing that came to mind, and that was fun to wrestle around with. Um, although in hindsight, I should have put up some sort of compl- complication that would have made it uh, necessary for someone else to help you. Perhaps it poisoned you, or it uh, had backup, and someone else had to close it. You know, figure out a way to trap or reroute the uh, other mimics, or I don't know. So yeah. that's my fault. But anyways, it was well, all hindsight's twenty twenty. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the first thing. Um, now, Tom, you were talking earlier. Uh, you mentioned to me that you know your players all have their own flaws, and you'd like. Yeah, they do. Uh, yeah, the, the group that I'm current, I was I, my usual mutants and masterminds group. That's also my this Star Wars group I have. I guess I'll just use names. I'll go ahead since they don't listen to the show anyway. <laughs> Hi, David. Hi, Aaron. Yeah. Well, Aaron, David, and Jake. Yeah, this or will turn out to be the first episode they listen to. Yeah, they're, those are my three main players. Jake's really good. He's just really good. I mean, he's quiet right until he's needed, mm-hmm. and then he's all he's he is right there to just throw out exactly what the situation needs. He's a fantastic player. Okay. Aaron is good too. But you mentioned he has a problem. Like his, one of his biggest is he has trouble getting words out of his mouth. Yeah. In a coherent way. Yeah. Um, you know, in the Grip Chalkasa game, somebody mentioned, you know, you said you like too much. But, I mean, just the way you guys listen to the actual play of the Modern League, Aaron literally was freezing like, up. Like, 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 like. Yeah. And I just, it killed the game to a certain extent. I mean, not killed it, but it really. Yeah, he, he, ha- he has some phrases he throws out all the time, like, yeah. like you know, like for the most part, like yeah. I was saying. Yeah, he'll throw those out all the time. Yeah, and those <clears throat> nervous ticks are just, you know, e- either you figure. I mean, that's beyond the scope of this show to give you advice on how to get rid of those ticks. Right, um, but anyways, in, but like in the uh, in this game, in the uh, league game, he also insisted on t- on carrying out long conversations with NPCs and other players. Right. So there was all kinds of pauses. Yeah, um, but yeah, in my group, one of the pl- problems is, is actually with David. Is well, right now I'm running a uh, game that's like Iron Age comic stuff, which is like n- violent eighties, yeah, violent nineteen eighties stuff. So actually, his his problem is a little more understandable. But David likes the violence. He likes to play characters that. Kill and this is coming his, his from violence. you, Mister Cannibal. Yeah, <laughs> that's not a problem. The problem is. The other players in my group do not. They don't like killing. Aaron especially. Aaron can't even play the dark side path of the Knights of the Old Republic game. <laughs> because he simply just can't morally bring himself to make those bad choices. Has he ever played a GTA game? No. Would never. he? He would never. Wow. Yeah. he um, And he gets really squeamish at horror movies. <laughs> He's almost adorable, is the way I describe him. I remember I tried to feed a, I have a bearded dragon, and I tried to feed him a pinky. It's a little baby mouse. And Aaron and, had to leave. Yeah, because uh, I mean it's nature. I mean that's you know red of tooth and claw. I mean that's and predators and yeah. he, you know it's not exactly you know nice. Uh, but calm. there are also times yeah. David will do this in a game where it's not appropriate to kill everyone. Yeah, and he. And he will not apologize. He's he's like, fuck it. I I bought this M60 with jacketed hollow point rounds. I'm going to use it in the nightclub where we're supposed to be questioning the crime boss. 
<laughs> well, uh, or like, or at least to it, like he'll bring it in, says, and refuse to give it up when he's carrying it right out with the bouncer, so they can see it. Like, <laughs> sir, like, are these, like, sir, you're going to have to turn over your M60 machine gun. And he, and I swear, God, the response was no, and opened on full auto. <laughs> Oh man, I like to get a recording of that. I mean, because honestly, I would. Uh, I mean, that to be fair, that that problem can be self correcting to a degree, depending on how much of an asshole you're willing to be as a GM. Like honestly, if I was running that game, I'd be like, fine, you kill the balancers, then the SWAT team shows up, and then people will keep coming after you until you die or go to prison. I mean, that that's basically yeah. that's how it happens. I mean, if you're and no other superhero would help you out because you just open fired on innocent and, people. And there are sometimes the other players with that was like you to see in like. You know, the hand of the forehead is, oh, God. I mean, are you willing to kill his character? or? Yeah, I, yes, yes, actually, yes, actually, I am. But the thing is, it's not, it's pointless to do it. It's, and if I just, if I kill this character right then, it'd be kind of like, like, David, stop. It's like, it's like, David, that's what you get. Yeah. And then he'd, I don't, you know, you don't know if he'd go into a sulk, but he figures with his games, he should be able to do what he wants. Well, he should be, he can do what he wants, but actions have qu- uh, consequences. I mean, but, that's, that, that's the thing. But that's actually one of the big problems is uh, some players just want to do their own thing, regardless. Right. Yeah, that's uh, another good point. Like, if you want to have more fun in a game, you have to be honest about what you want and what kind of... Uh, uh, but on the other hand, you have to be well, ready to compromise. Compromise is the most important thing, I think. Yeah. Um, it's just, you have a bang-up, awesome character you want to do that doesn't quite fit in. You can probably just whittle it down a little bit to come, you know, reach an agreement with the GM to make it work. Yeah. Like, I'm not going to give you that M60 because that's an attention grabber, but how about a nice Desert Eagle? Yeah. You can even, ha- you can even have it say Desert Eagle .50, like in Snatch. <laughs> the movie, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, Vinnie Jones. Um, that's the thing. You have to be ready to compromise to a certain degree, and don't be... S- you know, one of the things you could do if you want to have more fun is honestly let go of your uh, uh, hang-ups and your obsessions or whatever you have to do. Uh, try it from another route. I mean, honestly, now I've gotten to a point where whenever I'm playing in a game, I'll just say I'll play whatever's needed for the group. I don't, you know, I will play the healer. I will play the support character. I will play whatever the group needs to uh, help out, whatever link is missing. So, I think the best way to actually help that is to have games with pre-generated characters. Yeah. Well, yeah, that that can help, too. Do you ever use uh, pre-gens? In- I have several times, and actually, they've really worked. Really? Because, like, this, back when I had all my players, this was Andy and company yeah. before he moved to Seattle, I did. they wanted a Halloween horror game, and since none of them ever played horror, it fell to me to do it. So I actually, I made a made up characters of a uh, mob crew. Right, who are being sent into this really small Louisiana town, right, to uh, wait for a drug contact that's supposed to be delivering them cocaine from Mexico, <laughs> and then all a right, whole bunch of right. supernatural shit hit. But the thing is, they all had to play mob mobsters, yeah, and a lot of them had never ever played criminals before. Yeah, always they were heroes. <laughs> so to play characters with moral hiccups, if you will, you know, to, you know as they actually, I think as Andy put it, where no, you are a killer. You have killed people for contract before. <laughs> it says right there on the character sheet you, that you chose. Yeah. And it's even fun. I actually put, you know, I didn't tell anyone, but one of the characters was actually a FBI informant who had infiltrated the crew. Oh, nice, nice. And, and unfortunately, it fell to Aaron, who is terrible at trying to hide. At one point, he says, I'm going to go outside and make a phone call. Uh, don't anyone follow me. And immediately, I, I never even said anything about an informant. Every single player was like, oh, he's an informant. All right. <laughs> so uh, how did that game end up? I'm, I'm curious. Actually, most of them died. I would... Um, there are the... Because the other thing is, there you the games we usually play, they're playing fairly powerful people. Yeah. This is the first time a lot of them had ever played just a guy with a... Just a normal guy with a gun. Really? Really? Yes. And... Uh, I was actually throwing out some heavy supernatural shit at them. Yeah, and they were a little too aggressive. Yeah, they, you know, I I was using uh, like you know weird voodoo spirits mostly. Okay, I was going to ask what it was, but yeah, voodoo makes and sense. It came it came like this used to like a huge like demonic walking cr- uh, alligator was attacking them. Okay, okay, and yeah, he had to, all he had was a was a uh, Glock nine millimeter pistol, and 
he just like he just stood his ground. Of course, he was pantomiming, holding it sideways like a gangster. <laughs> and he says, "All right, you empty empty the clip." Wait, who is this? This was uh, this was Andy. Okay. And yeah, did about one point of damage, and then it attacked him and did much more than one. <laughs> he finally started to run, and then too late. But then the escape, like the escape, was a clusterfuck, and all of them were going to were basically every time that there was danger around Aaron, they were already like, "Okay, I shoot at it. You might hit Aaron. Yeah, I know," <laughs> because they, by then they knew he was an informer. Wow, that's cool. Um, we're so the, again that that sounds like a pretty good uh, uh, solution um, for dealing with players who are caught up in certain limitations. I mean, I, my eyes were open when I did that uh, World War II campaign. Right. Just playing a normal person was actually very excited, very dramatic. To playing a normal guy just trying to get by in extraordinary circumstances. So yeah, it, it doesn't you're, when, need to when be you're, when you're used to playing powerhouses. It can be pretty humbling to play a normal guy. Yeah, yeah. Um or even just a slightly uh you know, at you know, not normal character, you know. So anyways, but there's that but of course, you know, the other extreme from a pad the passive player is the overly active player who just yeah. who must be in every scene and every decision. Yeah. So if you're that player, really you've got to, you know, obviously you have to figure out if you are one or not. And the best way is asking your friends who are willing to be honest. I mean, usually uh, gamers, I don't know, sometimes they're very nice and too nice. Uh, Other times they're just going to tell you, you're a fag. Yeah, exactly. Or you're, you're an asshole or you're, you're selfish. Gay. Well, um, gay always comes What are you think some warning signs to let someone know that they're being too selfish to attention? I think the biggest signs are right before the game starts, the conversations before the game actually starts. Okay. Normally they're a lot louder. Yeah, and uh, especially if they're if it's if it's a debate of some kind, like what do you think? Like who's better, Wolverine or right or some other character? You can usually tell because they'll defend their position to the point of it's suddenly not funny anymore. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. I've been, I've run into that once or twice. That is pretty uh, creepy in its own way. Uh, another thing, if you are a player and you get if you notice yourself getting angry or irritated or short-tempered whenever you're not active, whenever your character is not doing something, to the point where your character is always trying to do something. You know, if there's a scene or an action where someone else's character is vital to success. Or more than once, you said, is it my turn yet? Is yeah. it my turn yet? You know, like if the thief is trying to disarm a trap and it's this complicated puzzle and you're the fighter and you say, well, I'm, I attack so-and-so, you know, I attack the cleric. Or I attack the trap. Yeah, or I badmouth the NPC torchbearer or, you know, any number of things. Um, you know, if you're constantly doing, you know, it, it, it's... It takes some introspection. It takes some honesty to determine it. So, assuming you realize you are a selfish player, uh, what do you do? How do you... I think the first thing to realize, this is a game. Yeah. Not worth destroying friendships or yeah. causing problems. It's simply not worth it. This is yeah. not a lo- grand life moment for you. Yeah. And if it is, that's sad. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. Um, you know, one thing, if you always have to be the center of attention, why don't you try and be the GM? Because guess what? You're always at the center of attention. <laughs> People are always going to you. So you might try that out. Although the players will <coughs> probably let you know if you suck as a GM. and Openly. Yeah. So, or they just won't, they'll make excuses and won't show up at your game. So, yeah. uh, failing that, try some, try to be the reverse of what you normally are. Try to just basically... Uh, if you always play a fighter, play a magic user. If you play, you know, this, play something opposite. And again, just try and open yourself up to new experiences and realize that, again, it's a game and that you shouldn't always be the center of attention. You, everyone needs to have fun, not just you. So, And for God's sake, I don't care if you know the actual muzzle velocity of an M16. Yeah, don't, it's not going to It's not gonna modify the damage you roll to hit the villain. Is that something David would... Argue? Not David, no. This is actually someone I used to play with. Okay. One, I think one time I played with him. Now, this is the person that... Well, wait. wait it says, the, the round of the M16 actually spins as it hits. You know, and, you know, when it, so it does a lot more damage, so he should be dead. Like, <laughs> he's not, okay? <laughs> this like, is this, a game. I, I said, this is bullshit. 
Yeah. Like, he's like, he said, a 5.56 millimeter, millimeter round at any velocity should have just taken him down right then. Yeah, if you get upset over something like that, you shouldn't be gaming at all. Actually, my favorite, he ever said, was involving yeah. the M16. And I says, okay, like, <clears throat> it's like, okay, I load up the M- M203, like, M16, this one doesn't have an M203. Are you fuck? No. He said, no, those guns come equipped with those. Not, you know, that someone could, I don't know, un- detach one or uh, decide that it isn't or worth the extra not, weight. it's one of the ones not built with one on. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, any number of valid solutions, but, you know, ignore logic. Just, uh, yeah. Or my fa- I, And that also led to, I one time he actually finally had a, one of those combos. He loved Predator, so Arnold's gun from that was what yeah, he yeah. wanted. And I said, all right, he used it. Like, okay, well, yeah, you're at a minus four the what? Well, you don't have weapon proficiency heavy. Yeah. Is this, but I have assault rifle. Well, a grenade launcher is a heavy weapon. And he's like, oh, this is bullshit. Wow. Wow. One time I played with him. Yeah. Never again. Yeah, we'll have to go into more detail sometime about how to de- how to rehabilitate players like that. Uh, but that's... Or if it's even worth it. Yeah. Uh, honestly, I think sometimes they can. Like, um, if the player in question... If you're a player, you're in high school and you're like that... You know, the last to be expected. You'll you'll change. Well, I mean, they're not all that bad. Um, you'll change as you get older, so you'll hopefully get some maturity. Um, well, as far as I know, I don't think I don't think Jared ever did. Right. Well, Jared had more problems. Yeah, he's still a stoner. Yeah, that's that has nothing to do with him. Um, so. If you're, you know, but yeah, I've yeah. you and I have both changed, obviously since. Yeah, then. yeah, yeah, yeah. We've both changed quite a bit. So, ten years ago, yeah, I exactly. graduated. Awesome. I know. Anyways, so that's you know, if you're being too selfish, um, you know, another warning sign I think is if you build a character that is contrary to the rest of the party and the campaign, like, not to, I mean, you're not really an example, but. In the modern League of a Game, your first character design, he was like nine feet tall, and he was obviously monstrous, and he had no way of getting around. When I realized the game was... When I, I had sort of hand-waited without really thinking about it, when I designed the scenario, I came back to you and said, oh, wait, you kind of need to be able to blend in with humanity. Yeah, and, and, and I, 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 we, I compromised with yeah, you. Yeah, exactly. You see, Tom changed his character, made him a little smaller so he could fit inside a vehicle, and spent some points on a little gadget that would allow him to... A, a hologram. Hol- a little hol- hologram generator. So, but. see, that's actually a great example of compromise, of taking your original vision and making it work with the rest of the group, because a nine-foot lizard mutant thing would not be able to walk around, you know, in a normal human city that well. No. So, uh... <coughs> But if you're, you know, if your vision of a character is like, my character's a pyromaniac who's always burning thing and he's a master of fire magic and he has to burn all the time because he burns with the fires of hell. And uh, this is, a, you know, a Power Rangers game with uh, no violence and no death. Then uh, that's not really appropriate. Oh, actually, I have a great example of that. I, ha- <laughs> okay. I have to show you. have the this. best examples, Tom. Thank you. I was playing a uh, Ninjas and Super Spies, mm-hmm. Palladium. And it was a group of mostly government agents. This one person who wanted to join in later, I, for, I wasn't running it, I forget who it was. Yeah. But he had just seen Texas Chainsaw Massacre Part 2. <laughs> it didn't involve Leatherhead, but... Okay. I don't know the actor's name, but the guy that he's played Otis from uh, uh, House yeah. of a Thousand Corpses. Yeah, uh, Samuel <clears throat> Haig? No, that's no, uh, yeah, Captain Spaulding, yeah. But you'll know, for those that know those movies would know which one I mean. And... Texas Chainsaw Massacre Part 2, he's constantly, he has a uh, lighter and a part of a hanger that he heats up and burns some of it, burns his hair off and eats it. <laughs> he was making a guy that did that constantly. In an espionage game. Yeah, in an like espionage James game. James Bond, you know, kind of spy. And even and... best, he actually took the, uh, the veteran, like the, the veteran spy class or whatever. Yeah. So he's a, he's a full-on sanctioned uh CIA a deep cover agent. <laughs> yeah, he'll blend in seamlessly at any uh, uh And I remember we, setting. that wasn't just the GM, the players were just like, dude, uh this really isn't gonna work. He's like, No nah, man, it's cool. Yeah. So how how did the the how does the character wind up? Oh he was fragged in the first session. <laughs> because <laughs> because he 
he has, you know, he said, he said now, like, it says, I'm a pro, man. Like, I got, I got records. Like, people know what I drink, man, because I'm, I'm in the know. So, some lowly KGB agent noticed a guy burning his hair off and eating it. Looked through the book. Hey, there's a government, a U.S. spy that does this. Bang. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, who was running that game? You don't remember? I don't. It was one of my old uh, friends from high school. It's good that, that he was away. able to kill off the character because honestly, that's that's the best solution is to. Yeah, uh, you could tell he had the he had tough the, luck. He had the tired look on his face, and he's a. All right, well, let's get started then. And you know, oh, he's dead. <laughs> yeah, this this GM took no shit from players. Yeah. So even if you're a nice GM, or even if you know, or the GM in your game is nice and doesn't kill off or in that contrary character um you shouldn't be don't be the player who creates a character this is going to be that much of a problem um your pl- your your pl- your character should add to the game not detract from it yeah exactly that's sort of the criteria uh talk with the other players figure out if there's com- some compromise like Tom and I did or if not make a new character it's not you know your soul that you're writing down it's just a piece of paper <laughs> with some numbers on it and uh, you should be able to come up with something else. Right. And also, more, and also importantly, it's not just you that's there to have fun. It's everyone else. Yeah, yeah, true. And you will have more fun if everyone else is having fun. I mean, I don't think the the great legendary game stories, the ones that you tell years from now, are the ones where everyone's involved, where everyone involved is, and in sync. Yeah, I mean, even if it's an action that only involves a GM and Tom player, like you in the tea shop and the massive nine low type. Everyone was on the edge of their seat because they didn't know what was going on. I, I mean, they, they, they were throwing out suggestions yeah. like it was the price is right. Yeah, exactly. And I was telling them to shut up because I didn't want but to eventually give you... you stopped. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It was just too much. And uh, it was so tense and, and everyone and, and, was so It was involved. tense for me because I felt like the contestant on the price. Like, um, I want no, uh, because uh. <laughs> you know, I would have killed your character off and you didn't of want to. Of course I know you would have. <laughs> You're Ross. And you wanted to keep him alive and you made a mistake because you thought you could use your sorcery with impunity. So that's that's the height but, of gaming. But it's, I think, you know, when someone just gets sorcery in there, yeah. That's actually pretty good role playing. It's like to I'm like I'm going to use this all the time now. Yeah. And then you realize that uh, oh, it's not as good as you thought that there's a complication. Um so anyways, um in general, like if you're as a player any time you're involved in a GM, you should look at some of the rules of improv acting. And the basic premise, the basic idea, the central idea is don't negate the premise. Never say no. Say yes, but. In other words, you know, your player is saying, you're a lizard man, <coughs> okay, but you have a disguise. You know, in order yeah. to blend in humans, but it's not that good. If you're touched, you, there's always the threat that you could be revealed in panic. And, or, it, in also, and it doesn't cover every sense. Right. Like, I still smelled pretty bad. Too. And you still take, or you still touch you know, yeah. you're scaly. So it's a workaround. It creates more tension. So don't just flat out negate the energy of the scene of your character. Um, say yes, but. So if your GM says, oh, you're, you're dead. Well, okay, my character's killed, but he has this legacy or in his dying action, he killed, you know, takes his grenade and blows up the enemy. Or, but he has a distant cousin who is going <laughs> to, or his friend is coming in, or, you know, any number well, of things. He mailed the formula to a Yeah, friend. exactly. So, uh, there are any number of routes. So that's the main thing as a player is, you know, you got to give to receive, you know, and um, that's the, the key to having fun. So if you're having trouble in a game, where you're not having as much fun as you should be, um, post it on the forums, email us, and we'll be glad to help you out. And uh, so, anyways, um, I think that's about all we'll talk about that. Uh, well, that. Yeah, about we, that particular, for now. We for still now. we still like to hear our own voices. Oh, yeah, that's the whole point of podcasting. No, it's gorgeous. <laughs> anyways, we don't have a letter this episode because Tom... Is uh, been lazy, but uh, I am not lazy. I'm currently actually trying to work out another gaming poem. Yes. Do you, do you know how long the Casey at the Bat one took me to figure out and write? Um, long right. ass Twenty time. minutes. I also have a full time job, Ross. Something you wouldn't understand. I have a part time job and I go to school. Ooh. Hey, it's MBA. It's business school. In business, I'm learning marketing. Don't ever say it like that again. Business. Dad, don't do that. Okay. You How about not. e-marketing dot web 2.0? That's fine. Really? Yeah. Okay. Internets? Of course. Okay. So, internet slang is okay, <clears throat> but um, You're not urban gangsta. slang is... You're not gangsta. Okay. See, but you just said it. Yeah, I know. Okay. Gangster 
I to me is guys with Thompson submachine guns. Gangsta oh. is the homie with the nine millimeter. Okay. Anyways, but we'll be back in a second with instead of Tom's letter, we'll have a, a movie reviews of two movies we saw that could be definitely applied to gaming: The Happening yeah. and Machine Girl. And, Just, uh, we'll let you chew over that for a second. We'll be back. And we're back with some, after that pod safe music that I got off the internet. It's for it's free. Well, it's free for podcasters to use in order to promote their own work. Oh my god, look at Ross knowing everything about everything. Sure, Tom. It's called the Creative Commons. He went to college. Well, you did, kind of. What the fuck does that mean? <laughs> well Because just because I have an associate and you got a master's <laughs> Uh, oh, I bow down to the <laughs> ma- to my master with the uh, master's degree. I'm I'm not picking up any sarcasm whatsoever, so I'm just appreciating. My it. God, look at the size of that brain! <laughs> it's green and pulsating. It's like I'm looking at the leader. Yep, the leader. Ooh, comic Marvel book. reference. Eh? Yeah. Eh? Is my nerdness supreme? I think so. No, you could have made a more obscure one, but I didn't. No, you didn't. I could have gone for that one movie with the brain that possessed someone. I actually had someone zombie like go massage. Oh, <laughs> uh, what was that? Uh, we'll figure it out later. But I was thinking of This Island Earth, a fifties B movie that oh, was yeah. the <clears throat> feature of Mystery Science Theater three thousand. The movie, the um, you know the the Metalunans, they had the big heads, and then the metal, the, the mutants mutates the, the bug things. Yeah, they had the big. Well, brain. the one bug thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, there's that. But you you remember. Speaking of shitty movies. Yes. Uh, we have uh, one shitty movie review and one good movie review. First, the shitty one. Because custom dictates we render the shit, the shit first. Yes, I guess. we. This is the first time we're doing it. Anyways, The Happening. The- M. Night Shyamalan's. And uh, granted, there's probably not much more we could tell you than you haven't already seen. It's his worst reviewed movie of his career which and worse than lady in the water yeah that's, that's a lot that's that's bad. i haven't even seen it i think it's horrible <clears throat> it, it's it, it's terrible but anyways but just when i think he can't get any shittier he raises the bar of shit <laughs> yeah uh <clears throat> the basic premise of the happening is that some mysterious happening happening causes people to blank out and then kill themselves and so Marky Mark and his family flee it, and they realize that it's trees. All, all characters whose eyes are like wide open the entire movie, even before the shit starts. Yeah, um, basically, uh, it's apparently his way of trying to do something kind of like the Hitchcock movie, The Birds, or something like that. Only they didn't—he didn't realize he was a bad director instead of being a good director, like yeah. Hitchcock was. It, it happens. It happens. Yeah. So uh, he made a really bad movie with really horrible, horrible dialogue and horrible, horrible action and horrible, horrible, well, pretty much everything. It was more funny than it was scary by any stretch of the imagination. Like, there's only one or two good death scenes in it. I think the lawnmower one was pretty good. I thought that was funny. Yeah, like, I mean, I mean, not good as like, whoa, that's gross. It's like, dude! I don't know. I thought the pencil in the neck was, or the uh, hair, uh, the chopstick, Hairpin. yeah, in the neck was good. And one or two others, but like w- some of them are so bad. Like there was one scene showing a guy getting his arms ripped off by lions because he's walking over and bumping yeah. against them, tr- trying to. Yeah, and to- you can tell that you know his sh- real arms are tucked into his shirt, and it's just so comically bad. It's uh, rather sad. So uh, and the twist, if the the twist comes after in the first twenty minutes of the movie. Yeah. Well, it's not even really twist. It's just it's plants that are doing it apparently. So yeah, a big surprise there. It is. Uh, anyway, so how does this apply to gaming? How could you uh, use the happening in your games? Don't run a scenario like that. Actually, no. You could do that. Only make it good. That's uh, well. That's what I meant. Don't do a shitty one. Right. Well, no. You could take the same basic premise. I could run a game like that and actually make it good. <clears throat> but the problem is the players are going to want to be able to do something about it. 
and they're only going to be able to understand it, and they're going to want it to be something that's actually scary or intimidating. Um, Spouty, you know, making it uh, some mysterious gas or toxin that plants emit and is carried by the wind is nothing. Uh, players are going to get frustrated by that because there's nothing they could you really do. You can't shoot plants yeah. and kill them. Right, and unless they're super scientists, they can't really do anything about it. So how would you make it into a good scenario, Tom? Well, I would kind of go go the route of, uh, remember uh, Dead Rising? Yeah. Make it insects. Insects are good. Because you, uh, you can actually avoid them. Yeah, and then they can actually, uh, you can actually do something about them. Uh, and actually, that's even closer to the Hitchcock movie, The Birds. Yeah. The Birds would actually be a pretty good uh, horror scenario, uh, I think. Where, like, one particular species of yeah. animals just starts... Or our family, or whatever birds are. Right. So, um, phylum. Yeah, yeah, phylum. Anyway, we'll, we'll get an angry email. It's, you're both wrong. And, <laughs> all right. And, uh, uh, good for you. So... The players are, of course, going to be kind of frustrated that they don't get an explanation, but, you know, whatever. If it, As a survival horror scenario, one shot, I think something like that could work. Just normal people trying to survive uh, an attack by a common element, you know, yeah. by a common thing. And using that suicide thing, I mean, there were a couple of actual scenes that were look cool, like when they were... When the girl's father and those other people were driving through Princeton. Yeah. And there was, like, dozens of utility workers, like, hanging from trees all along the road. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that was actually kind of a cool. Yeah, that, that was one of the few cool deaths now I think so about. So, you, know, you could do, like, if you're really good at building the scene, like, of walking into a city and just having... Yeah. And, uh, and not just corpses. The one thing that Shalomon did that GM should take notes, whenever you're designing a new threat, a new monster, new whatever, you should create a list of characteristics and make them consistent, you know. In The Happening, what it happens, ha ha ha, is consistent. First the person blanks out, they start repeating themselves. Then, and then they start, they lose, kind of, they, they start stumbling about or walking they start backwards. They start walking backwards and then they kill themselves. And he's consistent. And, and I really, it's like, you know, they calmly just look for the nearest way to kill themselves and do it. Right. So, like, by the end of the movie, when a character starts walking backwards, you instantly know, hey, the, the evil wind thingy is here. So we need to avoid that. So the, when you're doing a game run, like I've run a zombie game where I created a sort of hive mind zombie and started introducing characteristics to it, and the players sort of picked up on that. So by the end of the game, whenever they saw a certain type of zombie or a certain type of event, they could instantly know that, oh shit, the shit's about to hit the fan. Time to leave. Yeah, exactly. So that's <clears throat> that's the one lesson you should take across from that, is create consistent characteristics and use them to teach your characters, teach the players... Uh, about the what's going to happen, so, you know, foreshadowing and all that jazz. So, anyways, we have another movie, of course, Machine Girl. Uh, Much j- more obscure than the happening, obviously. It's brand new Japanese ultra exploitation violence horror. But, but, okay, believe this shit or not, I found this movie for sale at Walmart. I can believe that actually. Um, although I wouldn't be surprised if the Walmart version is censored a little bit, like the like the Kmart shit version of Versus I bought. Yeah, exactly. So, Machine Girl is a simple story of uh, a girl and her, and her brother. brother, and the brother is killed by Yakuza bullies, and uh, she gets revenge. They chop her arm off. She puts a machine gun on her. Well, not a, her. Yeah. The, some, some, the, the, the parents of her brother's friend, who was yeah. also killed. Yeah. And uh, there's lots of violence, uh, flying guillotines. Uh, guillotines uh, Ninjas in track suits. Yeah. Those are pretty cool. Other parents, a revenge squad of parents of the main character, the girl, machine girl, kills a bunch of people, and the, the, the parents, parents of, of those, those people, of the kids. yeah, want to get revenge on her, so they come after her, and it's just ultra crazy fun, happy time. And of course, the evil bad guy imparts his ninja powers upon the parents. Yeah. Uh, so again, how would you make this? Into, how would how would this apply to your game? Obviously, if you're doing an over the top game, nin, uh, Machine Girl or any of the characters in that movie would make great PCs or NPCs. <coughs> if you're running an over the top action game, yeah. you know Feng Shui, well, Hong Feng Kong, Shui is yeah, absolutely Hong super Kong good. action theater, um, any number of systems that Wushu, any number of systems that encompass that kind of high octane action. Uh, With plot, yeah. Well, there is a plot, but it's very minimal. Now, the thing to keep up is 
it it sort of emphasizes the you have to keep topping yourself. So there's never a scene that oh, they always start relatively simple and then they keep building and building and building until there's just this huge climax of violence or craziness and then they cut and then there's sort of some calm and then there's a new scene and they keep building and building and building and so it, it's just this repetition and that's sort of a structure you should use for high energy high action games is start simple start with a, start with a simple fight yeah and, and end with like two tanks and yeah. 40 troops well like the fight she has against um the one family where she comes back to the to them, uh, the one family that Tempura fries her arm. Yeah. She goes back to them and uh, fights them, you know, after she gets her arm fried. And uh, she kills the mom, she kills the kid, and then it ends with her... The, sp- her, the father's in the bathtub. Yeah, and she sprays the blood of her dead... of uh, of, of his the- dead family on him as he's in the bathtub. And that's a great, you know, like, that's... A great way to get revenge on somebody isn't to kill them, but it's you know hose them down because blood in this in this movie is like you know high pressure hose. I mean, oh pe- yeah, yeah, it, people, you know, it, you know that every Japanese person has ten gallons of blood in them. Yeah, fifty that, gallons that's, that's high under, pressure. Yeah, it's under high pressure. Yeah, uh, you know, Kill Bill levels of super blood. Um, so watch the movie and sort of get a sense that each scene they they just keep they keep trying to top themselves. They never. <laughs> It, like again, taking the improv advice, never say no. They always say yes, but here's what happens next. Yes, but yes, and here's this, and here's this, and here's this, and here's this, and so so on and so forth. So if you're a fan of the crazy ultra violence, uh, I would highly recommend Machine Girl and get the uh, actual Japanese version first, so they don't censor anything out of it. Yeah, Best Buy probably has the uncensored version. Yeah, they're uh, pretty good at that. Yeah, they they don't care. Walmart cares about morality. Walmart Best Buy doesn't. <laughs> anyway, so those are our movie reviews. Uh, so let's see here. What else? We have the anecdotes and the shout outs. So uh, I believe our custom is we do the shout outs first. Yes, so let's do the shout outs. Uh, I'll start with one. This is a Colonial Gothic, a role, horror role playing game from Rogue Games. It takes place in Colonial America, uh, typically anything from the Pilgrims to the Dawn or to the. Uh, uh, beginning of the American Revolution. So, what what's interesting about this game is it gets a lot of research in on colonial life, Indian customs, Indian tribes, uh, various Western, you know, alchemy uh, and Indian forms, shamanic magic, and uh, it's a pretty interesting uh, a book. With uh, even if you're not using this system uh, that it presents, it would be invaluable for uh, running a say. Call, uh, Call of Cthulhu uh, colonial horror game. So, if you want to do horror in a era that's not so exploited, just think, uh, if you're a Lovecraft fan, think The Case of Charles Dexter Ward. Good one. Actually. Yeah. Good so, movie, good story. Yeah. Uh, the movie Resurrection, which is, uh, The Resurrected, which is based <clears> on that story, uh, has a part of it take place in colonial era, so that's a good way to look at it. Then there's obviously... Brotherhood of the Wolf, which takes place in France, but it's about the same time period. Yeah. So, uh, again, there's a, a lot of rich fodder there that's not really exploited. So, if you're wanting a fresh angle on horror gaming, I would take a look at this. So, we're Tom? Out. And I actually have a uh, book I'd like to give a shout out to. Yeah. Mutant and Masterminds Iron Age. Okay. Which is, um, they've already done you know, the, Golden, the Golden Age book, which is like, you know, comics from the 30s and 40s, World War II stuff. Iron Age is the uh, 80s and early 90s, like the time when comics were much darker, violent. Yeah. You know, the, you know Sandman, The Punisher, yeah. things like that. And um, I, li- I like this one because, well, first of all, Vice City has permanent, permanently made me a fan of things 80s now. <laughs> I admit that. All right. But, and this, of course, my player David just loves this shit where... No, violence is the norm here. Where uh, you don't just you don't knock minions out; you kill them by the dozens. Okay. And it's and it's fun for Aaron for a point because he's playing like the lone spot of no, I bring them to justice, even though they're going to be back out on the street the next day. Okay. Type thing, but no, the book is like it's mostly about their Freedom City. Yeah. Uh, times during the eighties with the it's basically Freedom City Gotham. Okay. 
Um, there's a good documentary you should take a look if you're interested in the 80s crime drug wars, Cocaine Cowboys. Yeah. It's, it's in, uh, have you seen that? Yeah, I have. Okay, so yeah. the uh, So you can see how that would apply to an Iron Age game, right? Mm-hmm. The I mean, Miami in the 80s was, uh, you the, know... The drug capital of America. Two or three murders a day, and every and, day. And never mind, like, Columbia. Yeah. You know I, what... I think I, they, they had, like, six... They, they averaged about 60 murders a day there. Yeah. Uh, you know what a room broom is? Mm-hmm. You know, the uh, uh, terminology <clears throat> like that, that. That's sort of that drug cowboy kind of uh, way. So, uh, yeah. Sounds and, like a uh, fun game. Before we started, we actually watched... Uh, you know, we watched the movie Miami Vice. Yes, it's you know the recent one. It's yeah. not in the '80s, but it's good material. Yeah, no, it is. And we also watched Charlie Wilson's War. Okay, which is all about you know the war in Afghanistan through the okay. through the actual eyes of the uh, CIA and congressman who fought it. Right, right, right. Funded right. it. Funded it. Yeah, exactly. All right, cool, cool. Uh, let's see. I have another shout out. Uh, let's play, which is a archive of. People who play through video games so you don't have to, and you're saying, well, what the hell is that? Uh, basically, they play through obscure video games and play the, post them you know, with pictures and video of these games so you can see them for the first time. They're talking about like DOS-era video games, like uh, full-motion video adventure games, like uh, Dark Seed, Dark Seed 2. There's one that I, I love. is Dark Seed 2 uses art from H.R. Giger to make this sort of horror adventure game. And there's one scene in particular that's hilarious. It's like, you find your mother in this weird kitchen, and she's like, I will explain everything to you. And then her head explodes. <laughs> and, um, so you can go through, through the, uh, here, find your favorite video games from the, 70, from the 80s, uh, early 90s, whenever, and you can find somebody who will go through it all the way to the end and explain it. Uh, to you, uh, Sanitarium is another game. They actually had one of the guys who developed Sanitarium explain hmm. the game after the, somebody played through it. You know, and um, it's just an invaluable resource for anybody who's interested in older video games. I mean, they do newer games too, but really the uh, and like games that are popular right now. But it's the old video games that I really uh, interested in. So, right, yeah. Anyways, so of course, uh, lastly, we have our anecdotes. So. Yeah, we uh, sure do, and we've well, we we fired through a lot of them already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, I've got uh, yeah, more or less. But I've got we got two that'll be interesting. One uh, from the D and D game, the fourth Ed game. Basically, I started. We started playing at like eleven eleven thirty, or actually it was around midnight. So, and we went until two in the morning, and half the players were drinking. So, uh, oh, one of those games. Yeah, yeah, it was fun. I was uh, I had to drive, so I didn't uh, uh, partake, obviously, but. Uh, it was uh, using the Keep on Shadowfell, which is the intro adventure with quick start rules. So we only got through one encounter, the first fight with kobolds. There were like eight kobolds came in two waves of four, and there were four of us. And I was playing the pre-gen human wizard. The other players actually made legitimate characters with the uh, player handbook. And um, what's funny is that one of the players had never played any D&D before, and so we had to explain to him all, basically everything. And he was playing a cleric, so he couldn't really do a whole lot. And it was funny, at one point, you know, the kobolds yelled something at us, and I was the only one who speak draconic. So I understood it, and the player didn't, and the cleric looked at his sheet and then said very seriously, I have language abilities. <laughs> <laughs> we just like we just stopped and started laughing. It's like I have language abilities. I shall conjugate verbs at them, and uh, he didn't understand. He, we were just giving him so much shit the entire game. I feel kind of bad almost because it was the first time. But we we're like, you know, the first time he attacked and he did damage in a game, he did a whopping three points of damage to a kobold with twenty hit points, <laughs> and, and he just didn't have a whole lot of luck because he also ran ahead the rest of the group and you know got his ass beaten in by kobolds and nearly got killed a few. Times so. you get killed by kobolds, man. Well, these were cool kobolds, they had all kinds of yeah, yeah well, they had pretty... leather jackets and cigarettes and some muscle cars, <laughs> yeah, right? exactly. And motorcycles, motorcycles, yeah. yeah, not what are you talking about, anyways? So, uh, then of course, we have our second antidote. This is from a reader, Alex Green, who's also a flash artist. Uh, does the little flash cartoons on Newsgrounds? So let me just uh, pull this up and uh, got the email. Dude, out. did you just say let me pull this up? Yes, I don't, I, I don't know. You why. almost that sounded a lot like excuse me while I whip this out. 
<laughs> uh, Thomas. Uh, anyways, what would you do without me? I don't know. All right. First off, my role playing experience started off pretty bad in high school. Well, that almost goes yeah. without saying. Yeah. When a friend of mine brought me into a game of uh, BESM, which is Big Eyes, Small Mouth, the anime. anime. Yep. We were, we were, there were five of them, all around 16 or 17. Our party consisted of a fighter, pyromaniac mage, not a good idea, no. half ogre, half troll, and me being a punk rogue. First few minutes of the game, I came to experience the discomfort I later found out to be called railroading, walking around, uh, walking around town by myself. Guards were calling out for people to join the expedition to the Crystal Mountains. Ignoring this, I did what any player does when there's nothing to do and went to the pub. Any mountain. Crystal Mountain, Tom. Fine. Yeah, don't 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 refer to memes that you have nothing to has nothing to do with this whatsoever. Read. <laughs> uh, so he went to the pub, buying a drink. The bartender felt obliged to talk to me about Crystal Mountain, <laughs> which I couldn't care less. Meanwhile, the major's mentor asked him to go to training. You've guessed it at. Crystal Mountains. He decided to go for a drink and came to the bar instead. The fighter was also in the bar when, for the reason lost of time, a fight erupted. The guard, probably about Crystal Mountains. I'm just guessing that somebody met bad mouthed Crystal Mountains. And, oh, you don't do that. Yeah, apparently. Well, no, you didn't. And, yeah, you, you had to go to Crystal Mountain. Anyway, fight erupted. Guards came in, arrested us, and we were about to sentence us to work in the, guess where? Crystal Mountains. Um,. When the mage burnt one of them for fun, it turns out the ma- magic was heresy, and they tried to execute him, but we saved his ass for no other reason than we had nothing much to do. We decided to leave town in a hurry and fell in some stupid natural trap, and had no purpose other than get us get the half-ogre, half-troll to rescue us from some magical prison made of tree branches. This is how the first session ended. Wow, that's a oh, great man. intro to role playing. Anyways, yeah, see the first see the first episode of the Game Masters for yeah. railroading. Yeah, um, but it goes on. Next game, we all split up and walked our way, only to find ourselves each facing a, a cave, which eventually led us back together. <laughs> In there, <laughs> we faced a huge ogre and bravely turned our tails and fled outside the cave. Two of us ran east, two of us ran west. The island we were on was uh, shaped like a crescent. The GM told us we eventually all met again. <laughs> and at least we forgot about the Crystal Mountains by now. Well, anyways, angels or something came out in the middle of some cave. I don't remember how we got us back there, but he did. And uh, they killed us one by one until only the fighter was left. Note that the fighter was really a good friend of the GM. Uh, they surrounded him when he started glowing a, a golden aura color thingy. They said some crap that would make the Warkowski brothers appear like good writers <laughs> and knighted him a paladin. Woo! Fucking A! Power level's over 9,000! Oh, pass. Yeah, End of the second session. You won't be surprised there wasn't a third session. I don't think we let him uh, GM ever again. Then turned to D&D with a, a friend, which delivered a much better game. I ran my first game of D&D shortly after. I don't remember it, but my friend told me that I asked the paladin uh, while the players were in a cave. So you have uh, a mental link with your steed, right? Yes. Well, all right. You feel he's in danger. Oh, now you've lost it. By the time they came to the cave, they found him half eaten by goblins. <laughs> I'm guessing that's the same thing. So, yeah. uh, wow. You better get your well, ass to Crystal Mountain. Well, look, I look. We all admit all of our high school games sucked. Yeah, I mean, come on. There was, it's a rite I, of passage. I was running a, po- a post nuclear role playing game one time. Yeah, but then Face Off came out, and so the next reason, like, okay, yeah, Caster Troy. Yeah, that's the first time Caster Troy showed up, and I swear to God, he was a villain in every game I ran until after graduation. Yeah, D and D riffs. There was a Caster Troy, and it was yeah. always Nicolas Cage. He was always with his golden eagle, desert eagles, and he was always cooler than everybody, and he always had super fun. I think I remember the last time I played him was in what game you were running a Nightbane game. Yeah. And it eventually went to the Riffs world. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I didn't want to trade in the gold the gold globe plated pit and there were forty fives, not desert eagles. Oh, they yeah, were Yeah, get now. that right, man. Okay, I'm Actually, sorry. Actually, Springfield Armory 45. <sighs> I, look, I like that character. Anyway, and I didn't <laughs> want to give them up, so I... Okay, I'll just equip them with ramjet rounds. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, good times. And then you got Rifts Underseas, and that, yeah. then that was the shit. Yeah, and then... And uh, then we all realized, hey, Rifts and Palladium suck. Yeah, yeah. 
It was around 2000, around the time uh, Third Ed came out. After Third Ed, we never went back to no, play. No, we didn't. Never I didn't. Again. Well, it didn't I, you... I gave it a little longer. Yeah. I think I gave it till about 2001, 2002, until finally I washed my hands of it. Yeah. And that was a hard thing for me to do. Yeah, no, you were really committed to the play. I was. You were a mindless drone. And proud of it. <laughs> so anyways. Um, but eventually that... the Kool-Aid wore off. Yeah, exactly. Um so that's been episode 16. Help us to help you. Um, help me to help you. So uh, if, you have, if, you're a pro, if you're a player who has some problems with uh, not having a fun game, post it on our forums. Email us. Let us know. Uh, subscribe to us. Or hell, uh, hell, Give us praise or on hell, iTunes. Or if you think your problem is too big to just email, we'll do it live. Well, we can, on the show. On the show, yeah. Yeah. So we'll set up a voicemail sooner or later so people can call in and tell stuff yeah when we get around to it yeah it's at work and i'm the one who does all the technical stuff so uh i have a full-time job ross yeah i know and wait you're going to school and you work part-time <laughs> yeah well yes he does work for his father that's kind of unforgiving there yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. family business publishing uh, yes uh, publishing and drugs well no just the publishing drugs didn't work out too well no no it's too much competition well we do live in the meth capital of the world ross I don't know, not the world. Japan's the world. Well, of the, America, of the continental, America. of a yeah, Con- the continental United States. Yeah, I don't know about Alaska. Fucking ca- no, Hawaii was probably because Japan's. I think the meth capital of the. Why are we th- even talking about this? To show how much we know. <laughs> I guess. Anyways, this is Ross Payton here for Role Playing Public I'm Radio. I'm Tom Church with him talking yes. about meth. <laughs> because that has a lot to do. All right, Role I'm just going to stop playing right now. Bye. So far.